It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws, and it was a crazy full moon. We had left to head home, we took the back way. We live in a somewhat rural area, so the back way is very dark. No traffic at that time of night, and the speed limit is 60 kilometers per hour. As we're driving along and about five minutes from home, out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hits the brake, my wife's hand grabs my legs, getting goosebumps as I type this as it was a crazy experience. We come to a screeching halt in the road and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked its head to look at us. We both at the same time said, do you see that? It was huge, best guess, seven foot tall. It had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights and it was muscular and skinny at the same time. The most memorable feature though were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with a cocked angle in its legs. No sooner did it stop and glare at us did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on my driver's side. The only way we have ever been able to describe it was werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. If we had both not witnessed it, I'd have called myself crazy and never mentioned it. But we both saw it. No question about it. Ghost? Werewolf? Dogman? No idea, but whatever it was, was huge, mean-looking, and fast. I'm a vet student. My university is on top of a hill and outside of town. From my dorm window on the seventh floor, I can see huge wheat fields in the nearby forest. My first encounter was two years ago. I have a German Shepherd, Hades, and a Husky pup, Ragnar. That day I left university quite late. It was already dark outside. Usually I don't mind taking them out at night. At night I can let them run without their leashes. They are trained and I know they are going to listen to me. Besides, I knew everyone knew them and wouldn't hurt them even if they were left outside. They have collars that light up since Hades is fully black and Ragnar is fully white which makes it hard to see him during the winter. I could see them all the time. We walked for a while and they were playing and running around. At some point, Hades stopped and started growling looking into the wheat fields down the hill. I didn't think about it. There were bats, owls, and other critters around us. I leashed them, not wanting to run after them if they decided to chase something. After half an hour of non-stop growling, I had enough of it and decided to take Hades home and go out so Ragnar can run a bit more. I got home and expected him to go in his cage. He likes sleeping there. That night though, all he did was stand at the window looking out. Since the pup was whining, wanting to go out again, I tried to drag Hades in the cage and lock him in until I got back. Who knew, maybe he might try going out the window. I got a look out the window. In the parking lot below, I saw a black figure circling the cars. Thinking that it might be someone trying to steal, I got a flashlight and shone at it. It wasn't a thief. It wasn't human at all. It looked up, its eyes reflecting the light from the flashlight. It was black. Its head looked very similar to Hades. It was standing on all fours, but when I shone the light, it stood up. The roofs of the car were barely reaching its midsection. It let out a growl, which I later learned that many of the tenants have heard. Hades went wild trying to bust out of the cage. Ragnar was whining even louder. I realized he didn't want to go out. He was trying to get as far away from the window as possible. The growl made me flinch and I dropped the flashlight through the window. I tried to see it again, but it was too dark. I heard the crunching of snow as it left. The next morning I went to find my flashlight and found huge dog-like footprints in the snow and a foul smell still lingering. I borrowed infrared binoculars from a hunter friend of mine. Ever since then, I have seen it in the forest, crossing the field and coming near the hill looking up. I and my roommate have been taking turns keeping watch at night when Hades starts growling. I don't take the dogs out at night, and Ragnar doesn't play and run around anymore. He just stays pressed against my feet. I'm from a cattle and sheep ranch in Montana. I also have four saddle horses. The ranch that my cousin and I own is about 4,700 acres comprising of flat crop and hay fields stretching on both sides of the Yellowstone River. The ranch is located 11 miles northeast of the town of Savage. We rent a ranch that's 38 miles up river from us. That is where this incident occurred. The leased ranch is huge, comprising of over 13,000 acres. 
The folks that own it are multi-millionaires from Oregon who only visit it a few times a year. The ranch has very rough terrain and three small creeks running through it. On the very northwest corner of it, the land flattens out and there's an old corral system. There's also a long vacant house nearby in a draw. We had leased this ranch since the mid-2000s and had no trouble until about five years ago. It is normal to lose a few cows in the Yellowstone breaks, but we have lost 130 since 2016. We lost 17 cows the year that my horse was killed. Around half of these cattle we were able to locate. The animals that we found were pretty eaten up by coyotes, but a few we found were not. These carcasses looked a lot like other cattle mutilations with the skin around the eyes, the ears, and udder completely missing. It was highly unusual to lose this many cattle as they were at home throughout the winter and there are no predators in eastern Montana that could kill a full-grown cow. All of the cattle that went missing were cows and always between 3 and 5 years old. This event took place at the end of June last year. We had trucked the cattle to the ranch two weeks prior and I was checking on them that day. Usually my cousin or his son ride with me but they were moving the irrigation pivot that day so I was all alone. I parked my pickup next to the corrals and unloaded my horse. This was around 9.30 in the morning. My horse's name was Ace. He was a very large horse that weighed a whole ton and stood 19 hands tall. He was a quarter percheron. Ace was not very quick or fast, but he had great endurance and you could ride him all day through the roughest country and he would not tire. It was a pretty usual day until about 1 p.m. when I saw something that just didn't belong. About a mile away I could see an animal bounding up a hill. My initial reaction was a deer because it was about as big as one, but had the proportions more like a mountain lion. I had tried to ride closer to whatever it was, but I could not find it. It was odd, but not that crazy, so I just put the thought into the back of my head. The day continued normally until I returned to my pickup and trailer. As I went to load Ace, I noticed the rear axle on the trailer had just come apart. Keep in mind that I had not used it till earlier that morning, so there was no reason for that to happen. It was pretty late, around 8 o'clock, and it took an hour and a half to get back to the house. So I decided to leave Ace in the trailer there and take the pickup home. The corral fence was alright, but the gate latch had rusted shut to where you could not close it. I had a roll of barbed wire in the pickup, so I used it to secure the gate after I put Ace into it. As I drove home, I noticed a few large lights in the complete opposite direction from the corrals. They resembled a combine's light, even though they were further apart and brighter. Also, there would be no reason for a combine to be up here. I arrived home at about 10.30 without having any trouble. The next morning, my cousin, his son, and I all rode up together to fix the axle and get Ace back. When we finally got to the corrals, we saw that Ace wasn't there. The wire holding the gate shut had not been meddled with, so there was no logical way that he could have escaped. The corral had not been used in decades, so there was grass growing inside, but that day the grass was all turned up and you could see where Ace had ran around for a while. This was quite unusual as Ace was always a calm and quiet horse. We looked for him the whole day and could not find him, but we were severely limited because we were afoot. The next day, me and my cousin's son returned with the fixed trailer and two horses to continue the search for Ace. I also brought my dog Daisy. We split up to cover more ground and every two hours we would meet up. Around 3 in the afternoon, while I was riding around the rim of a steep, wooded draw, Daisy suddenly scurried down into the draw. I tied the horse I was riding, Penny, to an old cedar tree and followed Daisy down. The sides of this draw were incredibly steep and I was struggling to make it down there on foot. For a horse as big as Ace, it would be completely impossible. As I got to the bottom, I could smell something dead and I immediately knew it was Ace. He had not been touched by predators, but was heavily mutilated. He had the same mutilation as cattle with the skin around his eyes being gone, as well as the skin around his lips. However, his back legs were completely free of flesh and were just bone. His rib cage was also opened up, with all of his organs being gone. As I looked around, I could see the skeletons of at least three cows and it was obvious that this was some type of dumping ground for whatever did this. I was completely dumbfounded on what had happened. There was no way that Ace could have gotten here by himself, so he must have had to have been carefully placed there. I'd also like to mention that where he was found was a whole two miles away from the corrals. Nothing was adding up and besides, I had just lost my favorite horse. 
I sadly returned to the spot where me and my cousin's son were going to meet up, and we both rode back to the pickup. After talking to my cousin, we decided not to renew our lease. Our current lease will expire in 2022. My cousin's son spends a lot of time on the internet and thought that it sounded very similar to what had happened at Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. For the past months, I have been studying what happened, but have been unable to come up with a definite answer. So I posted this on Reddit in the hopes that someone can make sense of it. Feel free to post this on other platforms so more people can see it and hopefully they will make sense of it. Next spring when we bring the cows back to the leased ranch, I'll take pictures and post them to Reddit. After some deliberation, we have taken the decision to post about my family's experience with Dwindy or dwarves. My mom is from the Philippines, and there are many tales of supernaturals roaming every stretch of that country. Most sound ludicrous and exaggerated, but none more so than the Dwindi and the experience I am going to relay. My grandmother kept some chickens and dogs who roamed the grounds including a pair of turkeys who would wander underneath the house and freak me out as a child. One day, when I was still small enough to walk underneath the house dodging cobwebs and such, I came across some tall, thickly painted red crosses on the stilts and by the high walls surrounding one side of the house. Having never noticed this before, I asked my mom about it, who proceeded to tell me what they were about. To set the scene, it is important to know details about my mom's family home in the farming provincial area of North Philippines. My grandparents were rice farmers, and my mom and three of her siblings lived in the house with them, either studying at university or working in the nearby city in finance. A typical Tagalog house, raised on stilts, was built sometime during the 1950s and had dark, dark mahogany type floorboards and furniture. The floor where the dining room crosses into the kitchen, however, is made from bamboo and is springy when walked across. There are small gaps in between these whereby you can see down into the ground underneath the house. The whole compound was fairly sized with concrete and brick walls 8 foot high studded with broken glass for security. My mom lived with her other female siblings and chores were always shared including laundry. No one's clothes were kept separate and everyone's clothing went into one wash basin. The clothes were then hung on the various clotheslines in the backyard. Her youngest sibling, Ella, was around 21 at the time and started to notice her underwear missing from the washing line, prominent gaps where panties were supposed to be drying in the sun. Thinking nothing of it and putting it down to birds or another sibling pulling pranks on her, she learned to ignore it. Weeks passed and buying knickers was getting to be a very expensive habit. Angry and frustrated about the prank, Ella questioned everyone about why they were picking on her and her underwear only. No one owned up to stealing her panties with everyone absolutely firm and adamant that it wasn't them and retorts of why on earth would we do that. Ella grew less angry and just remained frustrated at why it was only her underwear missing from a line of six other people's. The maids were questioned and again, firm shakes of heads followed. There was absolutely no reason for the stealing. The knickers were not expensive and, dare I say it, some full of holes. There was completely no reason as to why they were being taken and of course to where and for what purpose. The washing was monitored for signs of animals or birds stealing them and nothing noted. If it was an animal, it would be very clever for them to only know to steal from one particular person. After so many weeks of this happening, my grandfather, having had enough of the whole situation, called a local manguahula, or psychic, to take a look at the house and investigate who or what might be causing the distress. The manguahula took a walk around the compound and immediately picked up that my family weren't the only ones living at that residence. She sat the family down upstairs and revealed that she had discovered a small family of Dwindi living under the coconut trees stretching their territory right up to the area underneath the house itself. Everyone was shocked and slightly bewildered as no one was particularly superstitious. Yes, they had all heard about the little folk as folklore but never had any connection with them. She mentioned that the Dwindi were usually tree-living beings and because they were invisible to people with their third eye closed, only certain people could pick up on their existence third eye being the psychic or sixth sense that allows people to see through the veil of our normal world and into a, another crossover. It is customary in Filipino culture to always say excuse me when walking under trees or in long grass to avoid stepping on the creatures. If you don't, the Dwindi can cast revenge, either making you sick or injured shortly after. There are both good and bad tricksters and malicious Dwindi. 
The man Kualula was able to see that the culprit of Ella's panty stealing was a duende of that family living there. She was able to attest to the reason why as well. You see, that particular duende had a huge crush on Ella and would steal her panties, probably to become noticed or for other unmentionable means. Ella and the family were then led under the house, whereby every single pair of missing panties were found, tightly and neatly folded and stuffed into cracks underneath the house. The Mangualula blessed the house with holy coconut oil and prayers were said to move on the family of Dwindy. Afterward, it was advised that red crosses were to be painted underneath the house and white crosses placed in windows to draw away and discourage anything spiritual to reside there again. To this day, the house is still standing with its fortress of crosses. Who knows whether or not anything managed to slip past the warnings and is residing there currently, dormant against the will of my family. It started two years ago, and it happened a couple times each year until the last time it happened, which was today. And I'm done assuming it's a coincidence. It seems like an extreme case of deja vu, but far too vivid to shrug off. Every five months or so, the same time of year, I will be in the literal same situation. I'll be at work, taking a smoke break outside about three hours into my shift. I'll be scrolling through Facebook, and the same exact images and posts will pop up in the same exact order. Memes, friends pictures, news articles, etc. Seems normal enough, maybe Facebook memories I had thought the first time. But it's not. My coworker just went to Disneyland for the first time in her life this week, and she is there now as I write this. I know this because she talked to me about it every day up until she left out of excitement, and also for the sake of conversation. She is posting pictures from her trip to Facebook, but for the last two years, I have seen the same pictures of her at Disney. I have seen the pictures of the fireworks in Legoland, etc., all in the same order with everything else on my feed, and today it hit me. How have I seen them more than twice? It's not possible. As I start to freak out a little, my manager walks out and says, Hey, we got a big to-go order. We need you on the line. I work at a restaurant as a line cook. I remember him saying this each time it's happened. I then go in and everything's as it was. No other cases of deja vu, I guess, from then on out. I'm worried that next year it'll happen again and I'll have to check myself into a mental hospital. I can live with a theory that it's deja vu or a coincidence in Facebook's algorithm, but it doesn't explain me for seeing my coworkers' trips beforehand. I don't know what to think and this is the first time I'm telling anyone because I feel like people I know would just think I'm a little cuckoo. Any thoughts? Me and two more friends bought matching rings in high school once. They weren't supposed to be friendship rings. They were just dumb mood rings that we bought really cheap from a guy off the street. But they eventually became kind of symbolic for us and we started calling them friendship rings especially because of this ongoing joke of how we couldn't lose the rings. Didn't matter how much we would forget it at school, stores, or restaurants, someone would always find them and give them back to us. I would go back home to see my parents for the weekend and swear I had forgotten the ring there, but find it at a random part of my apartment a couple of days later. Of course, I would just write it off as my dumb ass. Until one specific day, I was with one of these friends bar hopping in the street close to my house. We were standing outside on the sidewalk drinking with our friends and going to multiple places. At some point, we needed to pee, so me and her went together to this pizza place. She took off her ring to wash her hands. I had seen her do that, but didn't pay much attention to it if she was going to put the ring back on or not, since I was already ready to leave the bathroom. Later that night, we start getting ready to leave. She's going to crash at my place since I live so close to that street. But before we go, she realizes that her ring is missing. We go back to the pizza place, but it was already closed, so we write down the name and number and just say that we'll call them tomorrow and ask about it. Next day, we wake up pretty late, call the place up, they haven't seen it. She takes a shower and gets ready to leave while I have some breakfast. When I go back into my room to grab my keys to let her out, I see the ring on my nightstand. There were multiple occasions in which this ring gave me some chills, but this one stands out to me because I believe it was the only one witnessed by more than one person, 